and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Karis Craig, Associate Professor of Law at Osgoode Hall Law School. We will discuss her article, Critical Copyright Law and the Politics of IP, which will be published in Research Handbook on Critical Legal Theory from Edward Elgar Publishing. So welcome to the podcast, Karis. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here. So um, I saw your article when it came out on SSRN, and you know I'm always looking forward to read your work. I was especially interested in this one because I, I think your take on on these issues has always been especially intriguing to me. Um, but I thought that before we got more specifically into your discussion of intellectual property and copyright, it might be helpful for listeners who are less familiar if you talked a little bit about what critical legal studies or CLS is. Uh, sort of, you know, what are its premises or what kind of ideas animate it? And um, what, where did it come from? Like, what's its relation to legal realism in particular? Great. Well, thanks for the question. And I think you're right. That's the perfect place for us to start, because I think it's important to situate this whole conversation against the sort of backdrop of how legal theory itself has evolved over the past decades. And so um, critical legal studies is a particular movement that it has um, counterparts in Europe that often go by the same head, but I'm really using critical legal studies to refer to an American movement in US legal academia, um, which began around the 1970s and into the 1980s. That was really a sort of revolt against the notion of law, the formalist notion of law as a coherent, body of rules that are rationally applied to produce outcomes that are necessary and correct, and that instead tries to kind of blow up this myth of how the law works and to show that law is itself inherently and necessarily political. And so you're right to point to the connections with legal realism, which was itself a movement in US academia around about the 19th 20s and into the 1930s that really focused on disrupting, again, this formalist notion of law by, um, by attempting to see how law actually works in practice and if law actually does what it purports to do. And so there was a rise in legal realism in the um, interwar period, and then it kind of died a death after the Second World War, or at least it faded into the background as people kind of retreated to the sort of romantic ideal of what law is and how law functions and became much more comfortable with the idea of the rule of law itself. Um, And it was only, I think, through the civil rights movement and efforts to kind of um, advance equality in society through legal rights, and then a sort of a disillusionment with that process that led to the rise of critical legal studies in the 1970s. So would you characterize critical legal studies as legal realism mark two or not? Because it does seem to me that there's something different or new, like a kind of a special sauce of critical legal studies that differentiated it from the original version of legal realism. Yeah, I think that's fair. There's definitely a difference. Um, I'd say, if anything, legal realism is kind of the forefather, or um, that sounds very paternalistic, but is the forebear of what came to be in critical legal studies movement. Um, perhaps it was the the way into disrupting our sense of what law is. And so it provided kind of a stepping stone for critical legal studies. Once you disrupt the notion of what law is and how it functions, it opens the door to a much more political um, approach to law. And I think this is where CLS differs. What we really have in CLS is a leftist movement or a leftist revolt against the liberal structures of law and legal institutions that's driven really by a sort of Marxist inclination. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me because my take has always been that um, uh, 
sort of the original legal realism was sort of looking at law in a more instrumental way, and at least from a theoretical standpoint, was more kind of cynical about normative outcomes, where it does seem like, well, CLS seems to have a kind of cynical take on the law institutionally, it does have more of a normative commitment, perhaps, than legal realism did. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. And ultimately one that drives towards equality in a variety of forms. Cool. Cool. Okay. Well, so in your article, you specifically talk about a kind of critical legal studies approach to intellectual property. So I was wondering if you could spend some time talking about the sort of prevailing theories of intellectual property as a way of preparing people for understanding the intervention that CLS is making into that field. Sure. And I think, you know, in some sense, this is tricky because when we talk about the prevailing theories of intellectual property, I want to stress that these are what have become, I think, increasingly dominant in the way that we approach intellectual property. But I don't think that they're foundational. So I'm alluding to, here to um, the liberal property rights theories of intellectual property. So the ones that point to um, the deontology, if you will, of intellectual property. That's to say the individual who, under the Lockean framework, labors to create an expressive work is thereby entitled to appropriate it from themselves and to own it as a species of property. And this is certainly a common current that has been part of intellectual property discourse since its inception mm -hmm. and which still has a real intuitive appeal. And so sometimes even when we're not talking about um, Locke, we're still referring to the right for people to own the fruits of their labor as though that in itself is an incontrovertible premise. And that's very present in the way we commonly talk about intellectual property. The other main sort of discourse around intellectual property that people encounter is a more law and economics like approach. So um, framed under utilitarianism, the notion is that the intellectual property system is there to create the necessary incentives to encourage people to create works, which is for the benefit of society as a whole. And therefore, we put our trust ultimately in the marketplace to reward people who invest in intellectual property. And therein lies the rationale for the system. Yeah, so this is a bit of a a digression, but this was one thing that I found kind of interesting in in your paper, and I was wondering if you could reflect on it, which is that you use the term liberal, and I take it to be liberal in this sort of um, English or United Kingdom oriented sense to refer to the kind of Lockean deontological uh, approach to thinking about the justification of intellectual property. And I think from a descriptive standpoint, it, it, it's accurate to say that people who normally identify themselves with that conception of liberalism do seem to take up this Lockean approach to IP. But I've always found that kind of ironic, given that normally we would think of the sort of more consequentialist, utilitarian way of thinking about rights um, to be more associated with kind of liberalism in the traditional sense. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting question. And there's certainly something just about the semantics of of this discussion that, um, you know, in one sense, I think it is quite culturally specific. And then I think it depends like what body of scholarship we're pulling upon, what we mean by liberal and how that resonates. And certainly in the way that I've set those two things up as being um, sort of opposing approaches or at least different approaches to intellectual property, it is important to note that there, the relationship between them is actually much more complex. So um, that's to say, even in a sort of Lockean theoretical model where we're um, allowing the law to protect um, rights as a matter of natural justice, Locke, of course, was also concerned with the fact that the creation of the power to appropriate would allow man to do what is actually in the 
in service of mankind, which is to labor for the good of all. And so that's to say that the acquisition of private property through a liberal rights framework has some sort of instrumentalism to it. And similarly, that utilitarianism relies upon um, the notion that um, labor and property um, will um, combine to produce utility through the market. And so these concepts are muddy. Um, but I think it can all fit under the broad banner of liberal, as, as you've described it here, Brian. I think that's fair. Okay. So maybe then you could reflect a little bit uh, on the sort of points in your paper that you talk about where CLS challenges these kind of prevailing or conventional theories of intellectual property. And maybe we can like, begin our shift to talking about copyright more specifically, which is more the focus of, of your paper. So like, what are the points uh, of, of entry on which the CLS crit critique is taking place? And is it the same for both the Lockean and the utilitarian theories? Um, sure. So I think it's important. I mean, I, I want to add at, at this point that, um, that the paper is designed not only to deal with CLS, but to use CLS itself as a starting point for tracking how critical legal theories have unfolded in intellectual property scholarship. So I think we'll get to that and we're charting really a trajectory here. I actually do begin with the realists um, by talking about the initial critique of the concept of property itself and then the construction of intellectual property um, as a species of property in a way that is sort of self-legitimizing in a way that um, seems to provide a justification for the creation of rights um, based upon a recognition of value or an identification of pre-existing property um, when in fact, of course, what's happening is that the law is creating rights and new sources of wealth when it does so. So I'm talking here rather obliquely, I'm afraid, about um, Felix Cohen's intervention in um, 1935, I believe, when he was talking about the growth of um, trademark law and the protection of marks um, as forms of property. And he was pointing to the way that courts purported to discover property and therefore to move to protect property when in fact what they were doing is using legal rhetoric and reasoning to essentially create property or to create exclusive rights and therefore sources of wealth. And so for me, that's the, the main entrance into understanding the force and then the trajectory of critical theorizing in intellectual property scholarship is to look at the ways in which the very idea of intellectual property as property has been tackled um, in that scholarship throughout. So one of the things, sorry, but just to say one of the things I point yeah. to um, for the CLS movement specifically is their critique of the way in which the law reifies its constructs, law's reification. Um, law relies upon fictions and presumptions that have a way then of becoming real in the world. Law makes itself true in the world. And so one of the, the, the clear instances of this in the scholarship is pointing to the way that we've used the concept of intellectual property to essentially construct and legitimize the idea of ownership over intellectual works, over intangibles. So as you know, one of the things that interests me and that I think is nicely reflected in your paper is the way that intellectual property rhetoric and metaphors and language and heuristics uh, encourage people to think about um, the justification or theorization of intellectual property in, in particular ways. And I was wondering if you could point to some examples of that and, and how it works. Yeah, so the, the language of intellectual property itself, um, there, from a number of different theoretical angles, actually, intellectual property scholars have, have tried to critique 
um, the use of this language um, for for the reason that you've pointed to and you do so so effectively in your work on IP metaphors, which is that um, it is a metaphorical construct that does a lot of work in justifying something um, through a vehicle um, that is not really appropriate to the task. So that's to say um, the language of intellectual property has allowed two things to happen. Um, over the course of the past decades. One of them is that as new um, kinds of commercially valuable and tangibles emerge in the marketplace, we have recognized value and then we have found if there's value, there's a right and that has to be propertized and owned by an individual and therein we find intellectual property. So it has allowed the intellectual property creep um, to capture new things by analogizing across categories. So patents are just the same as copyrights and that similar logic must apply to trademarks and to design and to publicity rights and so on. And so our comfort with the concept of intellectual property allows us to sweep more and more under that umbrella. The other thing it does, um, and this is also, I think your point, Brian, is that it really allows for the reliance on a whole set of heuristics and assumptions about why we protect property to translate into our understanding of intellectual property when they really have no place there. So even a basic realist lens would tell us to look to the reason why the law grants protection as it does and how the law actually functions and if it functions in the way we mean it to function. And we can see if we ask those questions of property, traditional property or physical property, which is inherently scarce, we're going to come up with very different answers um, about why we have a private property system than we will if we ask that question about intellectual property, where what we're really doing through law is manufacturing a scarcity that doesn't and needn't exist. So I, I felt like your paper did a great job of pointing to how this realist critique of intellectual property language and of law more generally sort of um, exposes the mystification of the language of the law uh, in order to sort of normalize uh, existing legal categories. But it seemed to me that your your discussion of CLS also showed or further showed how it brought kind of an ideological critique into the mix as well, and one which it could deploy not only against the sort of more rhetoric or metaphor-laden Lockean approaches, but also against utilitarian approaches. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think what I wanted to do was set it up not so much as a direct response to utilitarian assessments or something that would necessarily um, undermine them, but rather just as an entirely alternative frame that has been ever present in the legal scholarship around intellectual property that allows us to question much more fundamentally um, what it is that we want the system to do and to, to actually develop, I think, a language for talking about um, whether it's doing that and what harms it might be doing in the process. And so to the extent that law and economics relies still upon a sort of formalist commitment to the functioning of the market and the power of the category of property within that market, um, the critical angle brings a much more skeptical and much more wary approach to this whole analysis. So it doesn't say that um, our legal structures can't be used to effectively incentivize the creation of works or even that that's not a laudable goal, but it forces us to look at the operation of that system through a critical lens which asks um, about how wealth is being created, how power disparities are being produced, and how hierarchies might be being reinforced through the operation of those legal structures. So you, you've touched on this a little bit earlier, but I was wondering if 
you could reflect on it in a little bit more detail. So the, the you know one question I had when well prior to reading your article, and in some ways actually I think the, your article and this conversation has clarified it a little bit for me. But I, I kind of wonder. I mean, do you see all critical uh, critical approaches to these kind of to kind of the two conventional uh, theories of intellectual property as falling under the rubric of critical legal scholarship kind of uh, IP theories, or is that kind of a subcategory? And if so, sort of how, how would you talk about the constellation of critical approaches? Yes, nicely put. So I think the way I see it is that critical legal theory or critical legal theories um, forms the sort of umbrella category for me here. And it's important to emphasize then that realism and CLS are, again, only sort of stepping stones in this um, in the development or trajectory of critical theorizing in intellectual property law. One of the tasks, actually, is to make the connection between the critical legal theories that we see um, being articulated and developed now, particularly in the form of um, feminist legal theory, critical race theory, post-colonialism and queer theory, and to draw that connection to um, the CLS or critical legal studies underpinnings of intellectual property um, scholarship, at least since the 1990s. And one of the ways, I mean, one of the tasks here is to perhaps persuade, especially I think an American audience, that CLS itself isn't dead because certainly <laughs> I think that's a common assumption and a way of regarding it that in a sense CLS was a failed experiment um, of its time that didn't really take off and people the most common critique of it and I think the basis of that um, understanding is that CLS essentially had nothing constructive to offer, that it was primarily an exercise in deconstruction, in politicization of the law. And, and so it left no foothold for those who wanted to repair our legal systems or employ our legal structures for good. Um, it sort of blew it out of the water. And certainly the feminist, the critical feminist response in the 1980s and 90s to CLS, um, which was predominated by white men, was to say, oh, well, it's all very well for you to just want to destroy the concept of legal rights because you've always had them. And, you know, maybe there are people who need to be able to hold on to and have faith in the, in the power of legal rights and legal systems and liberal concepts of equality in order to advance their political interests. So don't take that away. And so I think that, you know, some would say that was the point where CLS kind of died and rolled over and other critical voices took over. But I think another perspective, and the one that I hold, is that CLS kind of let go of the reins and accepted that this was the sort of natural trajectory of the insights that it had presented. A deconstructionist movement is never the end point. And so the ways in which the critical feminist voices and critical race theorists were able to both recognize the frailty of the law's constructs, to recognize the politics of the law and its rhetoric, and at the same time to place some faith in the power of law structures um, to channel power um, more effectively in their interests makes it a much more complex story, but an important one. And I think if we chart that progression in critical theorizing from the 1970s through to today, we can essentially map that onto what's interesting to me in intellectual property scholarship. Kind of a don't call it a comeback story, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Some might say so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it it always has struck me as kind of odd that that critique because 
for better or for worse, the CLS approach always struck me as kind of at its, at its heart being kind of ironically utopian in a lot of ways and not nearly as cynical <laughs> as it's often often made out to be. And, and I really felt like that came across in your paper. Good, good, because that's how I see it too. <laughs> cool. So an another thing that I thought was really interesting in, in your article was the way you framed up the sort of CLS and its progeny uh, critique of the concept of the public domain, which has become so central to the kind of utilitarian way of thinking about IP and copyright uh, specifically, which has become you know, so dominant in the legal academy, if not necessarily elsewhere. And I was wondering if you kind of lay that out for people a little bit, because I, I found that really interesting and a, and a nice corrective. Great. So, so yeah, I mean, when we're talking about property, um, property's other is the public domain. And so in legal scholarship, beginning, I think, um, with Jessica Littman's important piece in 1991 on the public domain, um, attention shifted from merely looking at the way that we construct intellectual property as a concept to thinking about properties other, to thinking about the public domain as a sort of site for protest or for revolt against the expansion of intellectual property. And um, Littman herself, you know, I, I struggle with this, but I wouldn't really classify her as a critical legal scholar. But by the same token, I think that piece holds a lot of important critical insights, because what she really says is um, that intellectual property um, or the copyright itself is only um, possible because of the existence of the public domain. But she also notes that its boundaries are inherently fluid. And this is another one of those critical legal scholars' insights, the insistence upon the indeterminacy of the law, its inherent manipulability, which is what opens up, I think, um, to being misused by power. So what Littman says is that copyright law has no clear boundaries and that the public domain itself has no clear boundaries. That every legal doctrine that we use to try to demarcate the property is inherently indeterminate, is flexible, it's open to multiple interpretations. So things from, she focuses on the idea of originality, for example, I talk as well about the idea expression dichotomy in copyright law the rule that you can't protect mm. ideas, but only expression. And of course, in any of these instances, trying to say what is original and what is not, what is expression and what is idea, these things are not, and um, there are no clear right answers, and they're very indeterminate. But what she says is that we need the public domain because without it, we would not tolerate copyright. Um, and so um, essentially because we wouldn't be able to tolerate the idea of the propertization of ideas um, because there would be no um, limit to that and it simply couldn't function as a system. So building on that, or at least um, I don't know if I've got the chronology right, but um, I see then the connection and the importance of public domain scholarship. And this is where I turn to Jamie Boyle's work. And he's you know, if the overlap between intellectual property scholarship and critical legal studies exists anywhere or in any one person, I think it's embodied by James Boyle. And his, his um, intervention on the public domain is key because what it does is, it, you know, it recognizes the way that law and legal rhetoric work around property. And it essentially says, let's do the same thing to the public domain. So if we're constructing IP, let's construct a positive idea of the public domain as though it too is a physical realm with real boundaries that can be protected against the encroachment of private property. And let's develop a language for talking about that. He turns to sort of environmentalism to talking about preserving the, the public domain against the encroachment of intellectual property. And so there's this moment, especially in the 1990s, where hope um, is placed by IP minimalists in the power of the public domain. 
And the reason why this becomes interesting when it comes to charting the development of critical theorizing is that this kind of turns on itself at a certain point, um, especially with the intervention of Mahadi Sundar and um, Chandra, when they say, well, let's, you, you accuse people of being romantic about intellectual property and the, and the author, but here we are being romantic about this public domain. Actually, as much as anything, the public domain can be a source of disempowerment um, and politicization um, that channels existing hierarchies and reinforces them just in the same way that property can. And that sort of gave um, root to a whole new critical angle where um, it might appear almost perversely that the public domain becomes the enemy. <laughs> and it might appear similarly that intellectual property becomes the source of potential empowerment. But that is exactly the kind of twist that we see in the shift from CLS to uh, critical feminism and critical race theory. So that's a, a, a recent movement that I've found really interesting and compelling in a lot of ways, but also puzzling in another way. And I was wondering, it's not really so much in your paper, but I, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on this, which is that I feel like a lot of this kind of recent criticism of the this sort of effective genderedness or racialization or colonialism almost of the public domain in some ways is um, quite trenchant. And, and I think I agree with a lot of those criticisms. Um, but what I find strange about it is this kind of conflation of discrimination and reification or or property. So, and I can't help but wonder whether is the problem the fact that society is discriminatory and so it conceptualizes a discriminatory public domain, or is the problem that it doesn't, you know, dole out property rights in the proper way? Because it it just seems odd to me that a sort of CLS radical left Marxist influenced critique would arrive at the conclusion that the solution is more property rights. <laughs> well, no, I know. And it's something it's something that I struggle with a little bit in some of this literature as well, because quite often I'm led towards a conclusion that actually I can't wholeheartedly embrace, which is precisely that, which is to say, um, to the extent that some of these critical voices um, will conclude that the answer then is a more inclusive and expansive realm for intellectual property and therefore the continued sort of proliferation of intellectual property structures into new areas to protect new sort of modalities of expression um, to me that feels counterintuitive as well um, to me it feels like that's that's rarely going to be um, the real answer I think it's sort of the aspirational answer to how to correct the system on the other hand, it might be a much more short-term, pragmatic answer to how to equalize um, the benefits of an unfair system. And so from a political standpoint, I can absolutely get behind that impulse and that inclination. And to the extent that it is itself disruptive, I applaud it. Um, so I do think that, that there is, especially from the outside looking in, um, a concern that either we have to expand intellectual property to embrace all the things that have been wrongfully excluded from it um, because of these sort of social, racialized, cultural hierarchies, or we have to um, reject it and resist it entirely and therefore refuse to embrace it or to use it as a source of empowerment. And I think we have to be a bit more complex about this. The answer is going to be very contextual and that's okay because that's what critical legal theory teaches us. You know, the reality is that power flows through laws constructs. And so um, as, you, as you suggest, where we have discrimination and inequality and subordination, it's going to find pathways through whatever structures we establish to exert itself. And the, the task then is to identify it, to call it out, and to seek to either restrain it or channel it towards more positive 
outcomes. Um, so I think, I'm not sure it's entirely satisfactory. Um, I think we can see in one hand that the sort of political movement might suggest claiming IP and using intellectual property um, as a source of empowerment um, by pointing to the ways in which it has been differentially applied and its benefits have been differentially enjoyed. On the other hand, I think we also have to maintain that sort of scepticism and realism about what it is that avoids falling into the trap of reification. Fair, fair. So in closing, Taras, I wonder if you'd be willing to speculate on where critical approaches of uh, to intellectual property and to copyright uh, are likely to go in the in the coming years? Well, <laughs> that uh, is a good question, but I'm not sure that I have a good answer. I mean, I, I, I've been, it's been kind of surprising to watch, and it's only really in retrospect that you can kind of identify what the trends were and what the turning points have been um, over the past few decades. And so um, if I was going to make an honest prediction, it would be that something surprising is probably going to happen <laughs> and then it will be subsumed <laughs> into the natural trajectory of uh, the scholarly endeavour. But um, I, I think right now that the point that I want to emphasize is that um, there's this whole strand of intellectual property scholarship that is propelled by this critical impulse and that refuses to simply sort of subject itself either to the rights-based theorizing or to the sort of law and economics approach, um, but instead is going to be driving home the sort of political implications of this system. And I think that is what we need in a time when intellectual property or ownership over essentially information capital is going to be absolutely key to determining um, who holds the reins of power in the digital age. And so I actually have a lot of faith in the capacity of this sort of rising politics of intellectual property to push back on some of those core assumptions and platitudes and general rationalizations that have been trotted out in favor of more and better intellectual property protection um, over time. And I hope I'm right about that because it's clear to me that we need it. Well, thank you so much, Karis. As always, it's been a pleasure talking to you and a special pleasure to talk to you about your excellent article, which I hope listeners will, will read. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I've enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> right mind shell out a buck get himself stuck for a civic endeavor that's meant to last forever as a center for the arts or why should a fella on bay street open the till part with a bill to help build a show place like no place this town has seen before oh why should a housewife in leaside Write out a check, stick out a neck On account of a scheme that sounds like a dream That may never come true Why, why should they? they? Why should we? Why should you? Because you like the big town You like the lights Your fill and blue street on hot summer nights because here's where things happen Yes, here's where things happen Big town, big scheme, big dream Because you like the big time You like the sights Crowds along Young Street And opening nights 
Because here's where things happen Yes, here's where things happen Big town, big scheme, big dream You're at the heart of it In at the start of it This dream is your dream too So grab a slice of it Cheap at the price of it Make that big dream come true Because this is the right time Right now and here To build a show place for centennial year Because here's where things happen So let's make it happen Big town, big thing Big town, big dream Toronto! Give to build the St. Lawrence Center Give because you love the town you live in. Because you believe in a living Canadian theater. Give for yourself, for your kids, or just for the wonderful night on the town fun of it. Give your help, your enthusiasm, and give your dollars. Because money talks, and sings, and dances, and puts on plays and concerts, and says, happy birthday, Canada. Give to build the St. Lawrence Center. Because this is the right time, right now and here, to build a show place for centennial year. Because here's where things happen, so let's make it happen. Big town.